I know what Alan is thinking as he goes down to Abilene to have watch his daughter have their next grandchild because mine will be born supposedly tomorrow. So if I act a little freaky today, a little absent minded, a little a little strange. It's probably normal, but nevertheless, you can give me the credit for at least having looking forward to something really cool. He hired painters to uh, redo his living room, and they showed up like Keystone cops. They, they came tumbling out of their truck, and they tripped over each other as they unloaded all kinds of things flying everywhere, ladders and buckets and rags and brushes and plastic. And the first thing they did on getting inside the house was open up a can of paint and trip over it and paint, uh, knock the paint over on the floor, which I guess was okay because the floor was just the subfloor. He knew better than to put the finished flooring down before painting. But they had brought the wrong color. It was a shade of pink when he had ordered a shade of yellow. The crew manager said, oh, we just thought this would be prettier. And biting his tongue, he got the new paint there, and they went to work. And after a couple of days, they proudly showed him the living room, and it was horrible. The paint had patches of dark and light in it. The, the original coat uh, was a shade of blue, showed through in different places. Obviously, the painters had tried to save money by buying a cheap brand of paint, and then, even worse, by mixing the paint with thinner to make it go farther. And he sucked air through his teeth, and he tapped his foot, and he counted to ten, but he couldn't help himself. He shouted, repaint! Repaint, you thinners! Repaint and thin no more! Repentance is one of those kinds of things that we would rather joke about than actually do. The very word repentance, I don't know what pictures it conjures up in your mind, but when somebody says repent, I immediately start thinking of some filthy bearded guy dressed in a dingy white robe holding a sign that says the end is near, standing on a street corner, shouting to the crowds, repent, repent, repent. Maybe that comes from a kind of a popular view of the Old Testament prophets, dressed strangely, acting weirdly. They too, you, you kind of get a picture of them with shaking their fist in the air at all the people saying, repent! Isn't it odd that we think of somebody shouting repent instead of coolly and calmly insisting on the need to repent? Maybe... Maybe that's because the very idea of repenting threatens us and leaves us cold. Maybe, maybe because if we can laugh it off, if we can not have to take it seriously, we can avoid the requirements of repentance. But, but the very urgency, the very seriousness of repentance leads us to think of it as being announced in strident, loud, raucous tones on street corners by strange people then maybe, maybe it doesn't have to be so urgent. If we can think about it that way, it doesn't have to be quite so urgent. It doesn't have to be so threatening. Maybe, maybe we can ignore it and be satisfied with ourselves and get on with being what we are comfortable with being. They came to Jesus telling him about the terrible massacre of pilgrims near the Temple Mount when Pilate slaughtered worshipers on their way to sacrifice. And as they told about it, in these people's mind, there were no accidents. Uh, these folks were somehow being punished by God for some act of sacrilege. Otherwise, of course, God would have protected them in order to bring himself glory. But here they were on their way to sacrifice, on their way to worship God, and God stopped them in the person of Pilate by having them massacred and slaughtered. And so these pilgrims, these massacred pilgrims, were not innocents. They must have been terrible sinners for this to have happened to them. They were, after all, Galileans. And Galileans, you know, by people in Jerusalem, are kind of looked down on as being a lower class of sorts, being the very root of false worship and, and compromise. You know, there is something comforting about being better than somebody else, isn't there? 
Yeah, I know how prone I am to be ashamed of myself for lots of stuff, but if I can point to somebody else who is worse than I am, then I can feel better. At least I'm better than those folks, and so I'm not so bad after all. Uh, we don't do it so much with accident victims the way that these first century Jews are doing in Jerusalem. We, we sort of pick the down and outers. We pick the poor. We pick the addicts. We pick the alcoholics, the... Uh, the sexually sinful, and we say, well, at least I'm not as bad as they are. And when I wake up in the middle of the night sweating out some nightmare, I can, can comfort myself. At least I'm not in the same boat as those folks. And Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Are those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. And there it is. There is that, there is that terrible, threatening word, that, that terrible and threatening idea. Repent. In that word is the revelation of the truth that God is not satisfied with me the way that I am. That he wants real, deep down heart change. In that word is the revelation of the idea that God will not turn a blind eye to my sinfulness. He, just, he is not going to just wink benevolently and then, then forgive and forget. In that word is the revelation of the notion that I am not... Even now, I'm not all that I should be, but that the battle in my sin is a constant inventory of imperfections that have to be rooted out of my thinking and out of my practice. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it but didn't find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any, cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Wow. This, th this mixture of mercy and patience with the, the furious demand for being right and for doing what is good and right. Jesus said, repent. Luke is real serious about our need for repentance. If you read through Luke, you'll run over that concept over and over and over and over. In Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist appears in the Jordan River Valley drawing huge crowds, and he is announcing a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. God is coming, he said. You've got to be prepared. And the way you prepare is to repent. Repent, he says. In chapter 5, Levi throws a, a big dinner in Jesus' honor. Jesus has called Levi to be one of his special followers. And so Levi invites a crowd of tax collectors and sinners to his house for a dinner party. The sort of folks that are looked down on by righteous people. And the Pharisees are grumbling and complaining about the implied approval that Jesus has given to these people by eating with them. And Jesus replies, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And what's interesting about that statement is the other two gospel writers, the other two synoptic writers, Matthew and Mark, also talk about this incident. Matthew only tells of Jesus saying, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And Mark, as he tells the story, says, Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And neither of them stresses what Luke stresses. And so it just kind of stands out in bold relief. I have not come to call the righteous, but I have come to call sinners to repentance. Repentance is a big thing with Luke. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells parables about God's acceptance of people who are looked down on by so-called righteous people. And Jesus says, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who don't need to repent. 
A little bit later, he will say in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then in Luke 24, at the very end of the book, Jesus prepares his apostles to go out and to announce the good news. And he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And so you you turn over a little ways and you get to the book of Acts, the second half of Luke's gospel. And in the very first gospel sermon, Peter tells these people what God requires of them in light of the victory of Jesus. He says, repent, repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you hear it again in Acts 3. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And then again in Acts 5.31, God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and and to forgive their sins. When Peter baptizes Cornelius and he's called on the carpet by the leaders in Jerusalem to explain what he's doing, why in the world have you you baptized these people? Why have you accepted them into our fellowship without first requiring them to become Jews? Peter explains all of, of, of what happened to him in the vision that he had in Joppa and then what happened when he began to proclaim the good news to these people in Cornelius' house, how the Spirit came on them and Peter said, what could I do? I, it, it's obvious that, that God has called them as much as he has called us. And so the people listening then say to Peter, so then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. And then Paul, when he proclaims the gospel to the Areopagus in Athens, to these Gentile unbelievers, he tells them, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. That is, they didn't know what God to worship. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Repent's a big word with Luke. It's a big idea. It's a big concept. It's right at the center of the gospel message of Jesus. Repent. Now, there are a couple of things I think that Luke, uh, the Holy Spirit, really stresses as Luke writes his gospel. Uh, One is the need for change. You you can't stay the way you are. You must change. But on the other hand, there is the possibility of repentance. Jesus makes real repentance possible. It isn't as though the Bible shows Jesus coming with this announcement of good news to say, repent, and then just starts beating people like a rented mule to do something that's impossible. But Jesus, in his preaching, in his sacrificial life, he makes repentance possible. The word repent, I'm sure you've heard this before, but the word repent, metanoia in Greek, which is the noun form, and metanoeo, the, the verb form, the, the words imply a change of perspective. They imply a new way of looking at things. So that at its root, repentance starts in this idea of seeing things differently, of making different assessments and, and understanding things differently. Repentance means that we have to start thinking of ourselves. We have to start thinking of our actions. We have to start thinking of what God is doing in his actions in a completely different way. Uh, We have to learn to see things as God sees them. Uh, Part of that is accepting Jesus as God thinks of him. He is not just a man. He is the Son of God. And Jesus is not a deluded and misguided teacher. He is God's own offer of life. And Jesus is not a discredited failure uh, who was shamed by being crucified, even, even if that crucifixion might have been unjust. Rather, Jesus is God in the flesh. He is living God's life on earth. He is this this man, this God-man who shows us what is right and true and good. And so when the people in Jerusalem hear Peter announce this truth about Jesus on Pentecost, and they realize they were wrong in crucifying Jesus, they cry out, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replies, repent. You need to change the way you think about Jesus from thinking of him as a liar who is worthy of death. You need to change to thinking about him as God's king who will save all who believe it. 
Now, you need to notice something important here in all of that, because when Peter tells these people to repent, they have already come to think of Jesus differently. That's why, that's why they, they cry out, what do we do? I mean, they're, they're thinking differently. Their minds and their perspectives have already changed. They've been cut to the heart. And it would be redundant for Peter to just tell them, well, change your minds. Somebody out there would say, you're talking in circles. I've already done that. I'm, I'm talking about what do we do? And Peter's command is not simply for a change of mind, although that is important, but for a change of activity. In other words, change your mind about Jesus and start living your lives in a different way than you were before. When you think of Jesus differently, when you come to know Jesus as Lord, you act differently. John the Baptist demands repentance, and he says in Luke 3 and verse 8, produce fruit worthy of of repentance. In other words, change your ways. And then toward the end of Acts, Paul is explaining the message of the gospel to Agrippa. And he says, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and practice deeds worthy of repentance. In other words, repentance is a change of heart it's a change of mind that leads to a change of what we do. And, and, that's an important and in there, repentance is a vital part of the Christian life. You can't leave it out. You can't avoid it. You can't ignore it. Change is necessary. Without repentance, you remain in your sin and your loss. Jesus said, unless you repent, you too will all perish. And in case they didn't get the point the first time, he said it twice, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. And, and, important and in there, it is a continuing part of the Christian life. As often as, as sin comes to the surface, as often as we are aware that we're not living by the image of Jesus, we are to repent. Repent. Luke 19 and verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this. By the way, welcomed him gladly is, a, is kind of a signalized key word in Luke. It means, and he came to believe in Jesus. All of the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here I now, I give half my possessions to the poor, if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will give back... I'm sorry. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Clearly, I, I, I'm pretty sure that Luke intends for this story to be a model of what repentance means. Zacchaeus, bad guy, tax collector, short, all the bad things as you can possibly imagine. Jesus comes to his house, eats with him. Zacchaeus welcomes him gladly and changes his ways. Two things here. First of all, Zacchaeus received Jesus. He had a change of perspective. Now, it, it, it's obvious that he's listening to Jesus and that he's changed to see things Jesus' way. I, I've heard people say, well, you know, Luke doesn't say whether Zacchaeus actually had embezzled money or whether he actually had stolen money. or He didn't have to. G Zacchaeus said it. Zacchaeus, you know, Zacchaeus wasn't dishonest. Uh, he didn't steal. And Jesus should probably have said something like, clearly this man was never lost in the first place. I'm just accepting him into my, you know, into my group here. 
It is obvious that Zacchaeus has a change of heart. He sees his sin. He gets up and, and says in front of all of this group, I am changing. If I have stolen money, I'll return it. If I've extorted money, if I've embezzled money, I'll make it good fourfold. He makes restitution. What I did was wrong, he says, and I will do my best to undo it if I can. You understand that restitution is a big part of repentance? It's saying, I am sorry, I wish I never did it, and I will try to make things right. Now, you may not be able to, and you can't undo an abortion, you can't undo murder, you can't undo a divorce and remarry. There are some things you just have to live with, but if you can, godly sorrow drives you not just to say, I'm sorry, but to get right with the people that you have wronged. And secondly, Zacchaeus is going to change his ways. He's going to change the way he acts in the future. And so repentance is that, that twofold thing. It's on the one hand a change of perspective, seeing things as God sees them, not making excuses, not trying to deny them, not trying to defend them, not trying to avoid them, but accepting God's assessment of the actions of our lives and then making the appropriate changes and being different. And Jesus says about Zacchaeus today, salvation has come to this house. Let's stand and let's sing. Repent.